everybody. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our speaker. Adam Zadrajny is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy and a member of the LIGO Virgo Collaboration. His research involves the search for electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves. Adam uses machine learning algorithms and convolutional neural networks to search for optical transients in targeted follow up searches conducted by the Transient Robotic Observatory of the South. Adam also works in the automation of the Christina Torres Memorial Observatory located in Brownsville, Texas. Everybody, Adam. Thank you. So we're talking today about the exoplanets and the test mission and how we, how we try, to, try to locate, uh, find, the, find the exoplanets. As you, as you might guess, it's, it's not an easy task because uh, the first, uh, the first co confirmed uh, exoplanet was discovered about 30 years ago. It was... Oh, can you go back to the first slide? Yeah, of course. I love that one. Yeah. Does everybody know who Giordano Bruno was? You know what happened to him? No. Because he said that. Because he said that. He was burned by the church. By the Catholic. Because he claimed that there were many worlds. Did you believe that? Sorry. By the way, if you go to Rome, if you ever had a chance to go to Rome, there is a um, queer plus uh, no Navona. I, I, I forgot which one it is, where there's a statue of Giordano Bruno and, and the memorial plaque. It's that same statement. I think it's a place where he was burned. Burned in the fire. That's, that's that's unfortunately true, but but the other on the other hand, it should be that the Copernicus who beat the the, the Ptolemy's model was was a Catholic priest. So, yeah. <laughs> well, <I'm, I'm laughs> but it was it was Poland, not Italy, and this might make make a difference. Yeah. Okay, so basically, the Newton the the problem with the exoplanets was that it at the at the some points when when we have only naked eye observations, it was rather a domain of philosophy not a domain of science, because we do not have the instruments to confirm, we could only speculate about. Even Newton can only uh, say that maybe there is something like that, but we, but we cannot confirm it uh, nor deny it. Well, the, the first uh, exoplanet confirmed was, was di discovered by the accident, a bit by the accident. Uh, the main, main author of the, of the discovery was, uh, was uh, Professor Wolstein from the Penn State University. He was conducting a research on the on the Arecibo, Arecibo uh, radio telescope. But what he what he he saw that there is a in the timing of the pulsar there is small differences. There was uh, there uh, and but those differences are a bit uh, different because what what the people know already because he were, were quite close with uh, with Taylor and uh, from the Carl Taylor Taylor binary those guys one of those guys. Notice that there is uh, there was a software for modeling the binaries uh, with uh, double neutron stars. So you have the the one which which is uh, which is pulsar and another cilient companion, some other neutron star. But but in this case, he noticed that there is a possibility that there is the, the, first of all the the companion is is much smaller, has to be far far. Or less massive than than the uh, than the neutron star. Secondly, there uh, there has to be at least two companions, others. So he he wrote the software for modeling binary systems to, to, to have it expanded for the three objects, which is I think was not so pretty straightforward. And uh, from that he uh, immediately saw that there there are three other planets in these systems. There there are three. There are, in fact there are there, there were uh, from at first, there was thought that there are two two planets, but uh, at the end there was a, a third one discovered, and uh, it was it started a, a strain of uh, publication in Na Nature and Science. So basically, the, this was the this is from from his Nature paper, and there there is the data points. Uh, there is a, a a data point and the model fitted with uh, uh, with, with with two planet model of the system. Planets almost 
everything, but there was a, at the end there, it turns out so that there, there was there's a... There's about two months yeah. of data there, right? Yeah, there is two months of data. So if you if you would like to, 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 to read it, this, 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 this is the paper which refers confirmed exoplanet discovery. There were claims before that there were seen exoplanets uh, over, over using the, the transit exoplanets, but they were not confirmed. It, they, they were confirmed about 20 years later when, when there were, the, the people returned to, the, to their observations. But at, at first it was, it, was very, it was extremely hard business to detect exoplanets. It was extremely hard. So first observation of exoplanet was in 19... 92, and first exoplanet around main sequence star, so most common in our galaxy, it was 1995. And first transiting exoplanet, it was uh, 1999, so there was about seven years of difference. But what, was, what, what, is, what is quite important is, is to notice that in the 90s we, we have the com computers that have our uh, current current day phones are far more powerful than, than even even the whole farm of computers used at the universities, and you cannot take so much data. As at that time, there was no possibility to take so much data. If you if you, if we go to the next slide, with uh, with the methods, uh, well, maybe two slides, uh, to the methods of detection detection of the exoplanets. Th there are several methods that could be used. Direct imaging. So, so we look on the star and we see the, the reflected light from the from the planet. Yeah, th this this is, seems most most obvious, but uh, but this is I think the hardest of all. The second one is the transit. We we look on the star. There is a, a dip in the brightness. Yeah, this is this this is something that we that it, that it's uh, most common method. The other one is gravitational micro lensing. So basically, we have we have a planet and. The planet is, uh, and the, uh, we have the star. And the planet is working as a lensing timing and radio velocity. So, so the, there is a, a change in the uh, in the velocity of the of the star. So basically, if we if we look on the plot, uh, if we look on the plot, we can see that uh, at the ve very beginning, the dominant method in the 90s it was radio velocity. So you you take the spectroscopy of the star and you analyze. How, how the spectral lines differ over the time. So from this you can you can detect the star. Even even now there is a quite quite many of the stars uh, detected. In the 2018 there is about thousand stars up, up to now detected in that way. But as you see, the transient uh, the, the, the transit method is the is the most dominant to detect exoplanets. It is is the most dominant. Uh, if you if you wonder what happened here, uh, it it was it was the start of the Kepler mission. So so we have the the, the tech, uh, telescope that it was uh, in space that it was solely devoted to the to detecting exoplanets. So it's a big big jump. Uh, timing variations. Timing variation you can see somewhere in the middle. Uh, and there is uh, and also it's it's possible to and there is imaging direct imaging. There is at least a few detected. So, so basically, but but the transit transit is, is the most dominant one. If we if we look on the direct imaging, we, it, it's possible. This was uh, this was in fact taken by the by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's usually, but it takes time because if we have a star which is which is covered by the the coronagraph, uh, it's covered. Then you see that there is a 2004 to 2012, there is observation of planet moving, but you but you need but you need uh, uh, some time to do this, and you require your system to be to be placed directly. Uh, if if this is your line of sight, you you require your system to be in that plane to be perpendicular to you. This is the Hubble. Yeah, this is Hubble from 2004 <coughs> to 2012. And um, this is false color or this particular filter? I don't know. I would have to have to check it. Okay. I mean, it's not real. I, I think it's 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 it's, it's uh, it, it would be a, a filter in in infrared. Yeah. 
Yeah, most likely they, they got it very incorrectly. Okay, so transit method is basically basically pretty straightforward. We observe the sky, uh, we observe this, uh, the, the, the star as long as it's possible, and we search for a small dip in the, in the star uh, relative flux. So basically, it's it's a pretty pretty nice method, but there is some limitation. First limitation is that the star system should be uh, on, on this. Uh, if there is a line of sight, the star system should be like that. So it's basically the, uh, we, we need to have a planet on, uh, planet crossing the, the star on the direct line of sight. Uh, so it's completely opposite to direct imaging. Uh, the second thing is that we don't, uh, that if we are, uh, if uh, in case of direct imaging, we, we just... Yeah, it's probably a very interesting calculation to see how much is the angular displacement for the tangential velocity. Yeah. If, if the velocity is opposite to the line of sight. When you're looking at the distances we're looking. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, the closest star is what? 4.2 light years. Yeah. That's the closest. I mean, most of these are serial uh, kiloparsecs away. Well, at least hundreds or, or at least dozens of, of, of parsecs. And, and when you look at this planet, if this planet is bound to the star, the angle of displacement it's going to have, as seen from here, pretty much zero. Yeah, ba basically, basically, this method is, is good for the for the uh, planets that are away away from the from the star. You can use it only for the stars that, uh, planets that are away from the from the star. Uh, on, on contrary, uh, the transit method is the is the best if the if the planets are very close uh, close to the star, because you you don't need to uh, observe for very long to, to catch the planet. And and if you for example have a planet with period of uh, four hours, uh, sorry, I need to recalculate it. Uh, there is there is certainly a, a something that can uh, around eight hours. So, so basically, you can you can observe the, on the very short scale. You can observe, and this method this method is very good for the uh, for the rocky rocky small for small rocky planets. So close to the close to the star and and very very small. This one is for, for, for massive massive massive. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting probably too much, but but I get excited with it. You know, this is the how. If you go to the next slide. This is Trappist. Trappist is almost identical to Taurus in terms of size. Yeah. It's a small telescope. Actually, I think yeah. it's a 50 centimeter mirror. Yeah. Just very good place. Uh, somewhere in Chile. In yeah. Basically, basically, which, uh, which, which, if, if you, for example, have this this transient uh, transient method, you, you here you have a very you you, you see. This is a bit a, a dip in the in the data. This is this is a whole whole orbital phase. So basically, it is a bit hard to. Well, to Adam, you say a big change in the data because you're an incurable optimist like me. If I look <laughs> at what what you put in there, these <laughs> this are two hundredths of the magnitude. <laughs> you, you better have a darn good photometry. To be able to detect yeah, this is, of the this, mind. this is this is uh, the, 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 the in this in this way uh, in this in this case the the, the main the main issue uh, is the is the very uh, uh, very well calibrated photometry. If you have a, a good reference star and very low seeing that 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 has, so then you can you can make so, such measurements, but uh, but the calibration of the photometry is, is crucial in that case. As especially relative to the, to the stars on the image, so differential photometry. But one thing that I would would like to point out that if we if we have the evidence of the dip, because here you have more more those points, yeah. then we can. If, if we, we what sorry? If we have the evidence of a dip, and <coughs> we and we observe it over multiple nights, we could improve the SNR. Yeah. If it's possible to make the observation. Oh, okay. So times. you're looking at the same object. 
uh, one night with, with a very low SNR, yeah. and the second night now improving the yes. SNR. If we, if we can predict, predict when, when, what is the orbital period. Uh, I was going to ask if are those dark data points there, has that been the averaging of a single exposure run, or is that yeah, it was, light? Uh, I think it, it was average, average. So you can, get, you can get a light curve from one, one go through, but you just bin an average several data points at once, right? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Let's, and one, one other stuff that it was, it was, it, it's very, uh, very recent, I, I think this, this was, uh, <coughs> sorry, I forgot to put the reference, this was the Super Wasp team. They show uh, show that there is possible even to, to notice if this if the planet was passing on the over the cold or or hot spot of the of the of the star. This this this, this part. This was I think this was published in in, in July or or in August. It was it was it's extremely recent. Mm. The Super Wasp team. And the, the other method to detecting detecting the, the planets, if for example we have we have the, the star uh, which is uh, which is lensing some other source star, and there is a planet, it would uh, it would affect uh, affect the uh, lensing. Basically, it was one of the first methods that allow to uh, that allow to detect uh, detect Earth size uh, uh, planets. I think it was used for uh, by many things, uh, among them Ogle, which 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 observed the which observed the, the I think the air planet of the uh, of the size of uh, of twice of the Earth of the mass of the twice of the Earth. But basically, the the, the other interesting use of this gravitational microlensing it was first detection of uh, uh, exomoon around exoplanet. Yeah, which is, it was announced just this week. I think it was, yes. I mean, that, that one was the first candidate for an exome, yeah. which yeah. requires follow-up data. And the one that yeah. they announced yesterday uh, was also preliminary, but it's a, that was via transit, right? Yeah, uh, yeah it was the, the other one. Yeah, yeah I am. Um, yeah, if it was I through mean, transit. Yeah. I'm quite interested in, in knowing, I have sort of the same question, uh, how the hell do you work because, well, you call it micro latency, so it's not like just uh, standard gravitational latency. Yeah, you do you, need, you you observe with things that are angle. massive as a galaxy or things like that. I mean, you, so you're claiming that the planet also is going to lens the light from the source star. Do you need to make really small angular mm -hmm. displacement measurements, right? It's it's yeah. more like the lens star. If the planet is orbiting, like I don't want to get into that, but like if it's orbiting the source star and there's a coincidence of angle between the two, then yeah. the lens star is going to bend space-time so you can see the planet. The, the, the signal of the planet is bent around it's that source star. Yeah. It's not like the planet is causing the lens. It's no, no, you no. can see the planet yes. from the lens. So that involves being able to see the lens star as it near approaches alignment, and you can see from one side of the orbit where the planet isn't, you see a difference between this side and the side with the planet on. Yes, yeah. you do need an angle of coincidence. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was rather more focusing on the, on the transit methods and, and other stuff. So basically, I know that the that the people that were doing the micro lens they ba basically observed multiple multiple stars and see if there was uh, there was a, a something called a lensing lensing effect. They, they were looking for a, for a, a but but this. I know that Ogle was doing this, but I do not know in the details microlensing methods. Well, that could be another seminar for someone that more carefully looks into. I'm, I'm curious. I'm not sure I understand. I'm making confusing to you.
the other one is the, the radial velocity so so basically you, you try to try to observe how, how the try to do spectroscopy spectroscopy of the of the star and the, if it changes <coughs> changes the, the, the motion of uh, of a planet the one that, it, it was used at the very beginning to confirm detection uh, confirm transit uh, transit candidate uh, it was used by the by the by doing the, the spectroscopy the spectroscopy of the star and i think the the, the one, one of one system that was uh, making a lot of one, uh, uh, one of the most famous system is a Trappist system with with seven rocky uh, 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 rocky planets, in the, uh, and three of them in the habitable zone. So, so it's, it's there is a warm enough to have uh, water in the liquid state. And it's not too hot that it. The gas stage. <coughs> this this system uh, this system I think it's uh, also from the dark. One of the dwarf stars. I, I don't don't remember what what the label is. Red dwarf. Red dwarf. I, I was not sure about that. It's yeah, I think it is a light photo. I mean, it, it's hard to remember all these data. They can work closely with it because yeah. data keeps coming up. I mean, exoplanets now are more than known and discovered yeah. more than ten thousand. A huge announcement in February 2017. So, about well, I remember it because I got so excited for one thing because I love Trappist beer. If you ever tried Trappist beer, some recommend it. It's the tastier beer you can ever try. Trappist, yeah. <laughs> but you know what a Trappist is? Is that an official endorsement? On the no, 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 don't go. Actually, there are several types of Trappist beers. Uh, I mean, in several brands. You know what a Trappist is? Because I think the name is, is, is sort of a joke. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, TR stands for transient, I don't know what. So they made the acronym very nice. Yeah. But for one thing, the team is from Belgium. The Belgian guys. The Trappist beer is from Belgium. And the, the, the Trappist beer is made by the Trappist Monks, it's a special order. They use this type of gowns. You know, they're very uh, brown and thick, and and they made this special beer that is so tasty, very high in alcohol. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, from 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 the guy uh, from from my, my friend who was, was working with exoplanets, I heard that it, it was it was connected with with the Trappists and the beer. The name, but I don't know how much is true or not. Well, that sounds quite strange. I mean, it, it, I doubt it is a pure coincidence that they're Belgian and yeah. they call it Trappist. Okay, yeah. let's go further. Okay, basically, the, the one thing that has to be uh, has to be mentioned that uh, we only distinguish uh, the planets if they are rocky or or they are Jupiter class planets, uh, gas giants, only based on the mass. Because we can measure measure the mass of the planet, but we but we assume that if the if the mass is very low, we cannot have the uh, we cannot have the uh, the gas giant because it the atmosphere will evaporate. Usually, those planets are also very uh, very close to uh, very close to uh, close to the star. So so we so we we assume that it's they are rocky, rocky ones. If you notice the the, the methods used, uh, uh, okay, they use Kepler as the as the as the method. So Kepler is the transit transit base. So this 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 stuff is transit base. Uh, but but this is uh, lava works. It's usually very close to the star, and and they have the orbital period. So you see. So maybe I was not not wrong about this three hours. I or four hours. But basically, here we have <coughs> orbital period of one day, so we have a very, very quite big population here. So this would be a Mercury, Mercury-like uh, uh, planet. This would be Earth-sized planets, and 
Jupiters called gas giants. And here we would like to, and here we will have the, the here we Earth will have around here, so we, we have one analog of Earth. Uh, at least in the orbital period and the size, but not, not it's not said that it would be in in terms of uh, being in the habitable zone. But we do not know what is here. We we do not have any any uh, planets with very long orbital periods and low mass because they are hard to catch. You you have about three hour uh, three hour window or two hour window or I don't know uh, maybe twenty minute window over a course of few years to catch to catch the, uh, uh, the the rocky planet with the with the very long orbital period so there is a there is a problem in detecting those types you can easily detect uh, the planet with the very low orbital period the, the shorter the better yes and we we could from uh, also, if the if the planet is massive, we can detect it by measuring the, the radial velocity. So here you can see how many objects were detected due to radial velocity, and this was a massive, uh, massive planets like so Jupiter's or Jupiter. How big is is the biggest rocky planet now? I think it's. Uh, I don't. I don't know because we only can distinguish it based on the on the on the on the mass. So I I, I think here it's, it's about. <coughs> well, that will give you about. See, I don't see the about, units about, well. About so three, 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 <coughs> three Earth masses. Three Earth. Well, this is a radius, right? Uh, yeah, a radius. Sorry. Uh, but so, so I think it was five Earth masses, but I, I, I rely on my memory. About five, and, and about, about three Earth radiuses, which means, yeah, so it's, that would be nine times bigger than the Earth. No, 27, so almost 30 times bigger than the Earth. How much bigger than the Earth is Jupiter? It's it's about uh, a thousand times bigger. Here is the Jupiter in the a thousand times bigger. Yeah, you can yeah. fit about a thousand Earth seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the, is, is there any inherent limit in how rocky a planet can be? I guess uh, I guess it is. Yeah, because at some point you're going to start to thermalize your entire interior, and at that point, all of your atmosphere is going to all that heat and you'll either lose your atmosphere and, uh, and become but, 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 but at the same time when you when, when, when you have that much mass you have uh, enough gravitational attraction to keep the atmosphere right I know there is an upper limit to how rocky it can get I think it's somewhere between 10 and 20 no 10 or 3 or something like that but I, I'm not exactly okay sure. we, we need to check that um, yeah mm -hmm. Extremely hard. So Earth and Mars would be in the frontier. Yeah. yeah. Well, this I think is for whoever is interested in persisting and to learn and then share. Basically, basically, if something has, as I said, basically if something has a very, very long period, we can uh, we can detect it mostly by radial velocity, but it's also the massive planets and transit uh, transit planets we can detect, but it's usually not not more than than the few hundred days. Here is the micro lensing is it was only only a few cases. It was not not very very easy method to use. We have the very few data points. 
Yeah. And the planet's known by size, it's uh, Mars size, we, we only need a few planets like that, Earth size is it's about 200. <coughs> this is taken from the Kepler data from 2006, and, and we were sh sh showing how, how many Kepler adds to, to the, each, each type, and, and the Gauss channels are, are here. So Kepler, Kepler mostly doubled the uh, super size Earth and and there was there was one publication which appears in the uh, in the February in Astrophysical Journal Letters that the probing extragalactic planets using quasar micro lensing and what, what they, they claim that that they're only we, we show that the population of unbound planets between star masses ranging from Moon to Jupiter needed to explain the three point uh, uh, it's an um, iron line in the energy shift observed in the gravitational lens uh, quasar. Uh, so, so this, this is probably like a salt, but yeah. sort of potassium, potassium or something like that. K is potassium, isn't it? Yeah. With, uh, well, uh, there's a K there. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we need the K. Yeah. Oh, the, oh, is it the K line of the iron? Yeah. Yeah, Adam, yeah. which is different. Okay, okay. So that that particular wavelength. Yeah, but but this is this this was one publication and it was uh, uh, it was it was in February. But this. But let me ask a question. Yeah. Uh, so there are about three thousand, pretty much well established as existing. Planet. What is the volume of the galaxy that that comprises? Or, you know, if the radius of the galaxy is, <coughs> what is it, 15 kiloparsecs? How big is our galaxy? The radius? Uh, it's huh? like 50,000 light years. 50,000 light years. Uh, uh, 50, 50, 50, 50, what did I say, 15k? So, in kiloparsecs, well, that's about 50,000 50, light years, yes. Uh, the number I remember better is 15 kiloparsecs. But, but multiply by three and, and that's... Uh, okay, so what is the... Which volume of the galaxy is covered by the planets that we know? <coughs> they are found within what volume? No, it's. Uh, I, I I guess we we cover only a very small fraction of it. Yeah. I don't know its specifics, but it's something like if the galaxy is a meter in diameter, we've searched pretty much less than a dime in terms of all of the known planets are within a dime of that meter galaxy. Something like that. I, I, it's only order of a meter, and it's less. That's than what I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we barely managed to, to get out of our back here, and we're going to be looking at another galaxy. Okay. I, mean, I was, I was. The, uh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking, but I, I have no idea. Maybe, maybe they're right, but it's no, but it, it's hard to believe, isn't it? This yeah. is this is a bit a bit hard, uh, but 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 it shows uh, it shows the way way the research is going. No, 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 I, and it is interesting as, as a concept. No, no, I, 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 I would joke, you know, you, you, know you, you should never be a skeptical on the basis of arguments like they want to just use. But my point is, it's, it's incredible in, yeah. in a good sense. Yeah. There, there was, there was, uh, yeah, this, this is, this is, yeah, but, but this is, this is a very, if, if something like that would be found in other galaxies, maybe we, it could be considered confirmed, but, but we, we do not have any tools to confirm it. All I want to do is call everybody's attention to relative sizes here. What yeah. we're talking about and what, what, what the universe is. Exactly. So that's the amazing part, isn't it? Yeah. Basically, uh, if, you, if you look, for example, for uh, there is an exoplanetary archive at Caltech, 
What is important, what might be important is the, also the, the capital candidates that are listed. And maybe this, this might be an option to, to use it. I know that for sure TESS will have something like that, but Kepler, Kepler also have the, the candidates to confirm it. Yeah, I will be going faster. Okay. No, 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 it's our fault, our fault. You, 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 here's more than 60% of your time you still haven't talked about the subject. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Basically, the, but the, it's my fault. The first, the first, uh, the first, uh, the, this, this section was, was called tools of trade, but basically the, the some uh, instruments that were used. Uh, for example, Arecibo, as I mentioned, was the, the used for discovered uh, the, the first planets. I don't think that they're discovered anymore on this radio telescope, but it was the first good uh, good attempt. Also, the Arecibo is, is known for the first indirect evidence of gravitational waves uh, observations, thanks to the observation of uh, Hull's Tyler binary. Uh, the other other experiment which I found interesting it was it was Ogle's optical gravitational lensing experiment. They, they mostly were devoted to uh, observing micro lensing and and some uh, small massive ob dim objects that were that might cause micro lensing techniques. They started in uh, in 1992 and the experiment if if you, uh, the the guy uh, the guy who was uh, discovered the first uh, planets around Pulsar was from the Penn State. And this, uh, this experiment was also initiated, the idea, idea uh, the guy who invented the microlensing uh, technique, uh, who, was, who was thinking about it was Bogdan Paczynski, but uh, and he, he sold his idea to Andrzej Udalski, Udalski uh, to, to, to build Ogle. Uh, Paczynski was, was from Penn State, he had a lot of ideas. He, were writing a paper and, and giving the ideas to the other to, 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 to do it. Uh, but basically the, the notable planet was the, the it was of the 2005 uh, which was which was the discovered by the, the micro lensing. Oh yeah, here you have 5.5 Earth mass and with the orbital period about 10 years. And it, it's, it's incredibly uh, ice, uh, ice cold world. And the other one, it was Oglet tier uh, 56B, and it was transit, but it was it had to be confirmed by by ra radial uh, uh, spectro by spectroscopy. Uh, the other, the I think this uh, pr prior to Kepler, this was I think one of the most successful uh, successful uh, observatories for uh, searching of the planets. It was wide angle search for the planets. And when they were, and it was called WASP, and when they opened the, the, the second one, observatory in Canary Islands, they called themselves Super WASP. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have about uh, 157 uh, uh, exoplanets confirmed. The other, uh, this was uh, the other experiment which was also uh, discovering a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of exoplanets, it was uh, CARPS, which was high accuracy radio velocity planet searcher. It was installed in the uh, in 2002 at ESO uh, uh, European Southern Observatory at, uh, at La Silla site in Chile. And there was 130 exoplanets. So, the Kepler. Uh, okay, Kepler uh, was launched in March 2009. He discovered about 23,000 exoplanets, so it was a really big number, and there is about uh, 3,601 candidates to be confirmed or denied. And eclipsing binaries. He discovered about 2,000 uh, uh, eclipsing binaries. The problem with eclipsing binaries is the source, source of the false positive for the transients. And this is and this is the main problem for TESS. So basically, if you're looking for exoplanets, you, you might end up with this one. And this so you think it's an exoplanet, but it's, it's actually two binaries yeah. are orbiting each other. And or for example, a, a star plus brown dwarf, which is not an exoplanet. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, this is, this is something that's, that's a, a problem and needs to be taken out from the data. There is a, a Kepler objects of interest for potential follow-up. There is another another funny stuff. I think
think it started only four years ago or <coughs> less, was Planet Counters. And basically the, the Kepler was uh, showing all the, the data, data that they have. And they were searching for the, and, and people could search, uh, look on the, on the light cube and search for the, for the potential, uh, uh, potential uh, stuff that was missed by the algorithm. I think there was 51 exoplanets found that way. And the people were uh, co-authors of the paper. There so. were some habitable exoplanets found that way too. Okay, I didn't know about it. Basically, if you if you look on the on where those candidates are usually in the uh, they're in the, the the small smaller sizes region, not, not very not very massive, but but this is this is the candidates that distribution of the candidates, not not all of them, but some representative sample. And the, the Kepler uh, and Kepler was able to find the Earth size. missions that were that were uh, the, the Hubble space the, the, the exoplanet missions the Hubble was used for almost everything I think in in, 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 in astronomy uh, even for uh, searching for uh, new counterparts gravitational waves the, the Spitzer uh, Spitzer was was I think in the in the twenties but then was launched Kepler in two thousand nine which was which was bringing the most of the exoplanet that we know today the, and the test mission just launched uh, launch in the March this year. And the next next thing in, in uh, 2020 20 should be the James Webb Space Telescope. And, and there, there was uh, a few others proposed. For example, uh, the telescope. I think they, they renamed the telescope because there was a telescope at last which was, uh, uh, it was uh, about six diameter in the mirror. But I think it was cancelled. I don't know what was the. Okay, uh, so we are getting to the to the test, which is one of the main main, main stuff that we that we want to talk today. It's a transiting exoplanet survey satellite. Uh, launch day it was not not March it was April two thousand eighteen, and the first light was in August. So uh, it was not not so long time ago, about two months. And it's the, the main aim of the of the of the of the of this mission is to survey the the, the brightest stars around Earth. So basically, in, in, in most cases, this is the closest ones too. And the sky coverage it's about eighty five percent of the sky coverage. So it's it's pretty pretty good. And the field of view uh, there is it's twenty four degrees by uh, ninety six uh, degrees. It's it's composed by the by by the mosaic of the of the of the CCDs, which which each each of one has the field of uh, which is it's mosaic of the CCDs. And I think there there is a there is a double mosaic because there is I will just 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 move on to the, the next slide. But basically, the for each each point it would be observed by twenty four uh, twenty seven point four days. So we will have the data data from the area for, for a very long time. And basically this is the the field of view over one one, one point in which would be observed continuously. And as you might guess the most most cover area it will be more than the, the poles. Where is it already? Uh, it's orbiting between. Uh, I think there is. If, if you orbit, there is something tricky. Uh, there is a synchronous. Uh, I think no. If it's not orbiting between. Uh, it's the. If, if I, I don't remember correctly the orbit. I don't even know if I know. I I'm not sure about it. From what I what I remember, it was. Uh, it was uh, it, the orbit was about uh, one uh, thousand uh, one hundred thousand kilometers from Earth. So, uh, so this is how far? I think it's almost one third of third of the moon, but one third of the moon. So it's very far away. It's quite far away. So, but there is some tricky stuff with the orbit. I I, I we, we can check it after after afterwards because this is. Uh, 
if you look on the on the on the time or on the coverage of the sky, this is this is uh, synchronized with the moon, basically with the orbital. Period so it of probably the moon. then it has to be at a particular point of equilibrium between the the moon and the earth, because yeah, otherwise it would be a, it would be affected by the moon. Yeah. So it's a Lagrangian point. Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure about I I I don't. I'm not sure no, about that, so I'm not speculating it. too. I'm, I'm, yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea. Basically, basically, if you if if you look on the uh, and what is what is quite important, the sensitivity of this of the CCDs would be uh, shifted to, towards uh, towards the infrared. So we we have everything down down from uh, red red uh, Johnson red band. So. Rather, uh, rather uh, infrared stuff. The, the problem is with uh, with the eclipsing binaries because we, if we have the population of planets, the period would be it's from uh, from days to the hundreds of days. But we have the uh, hierarchical uh, Eclipsing binaries, so we have, we have the three star systems. So, and this would uh, would be covered by this would make can mix easily with with the planet population. We have the uh, uh, blended uh, blended eclipsing binaries when the target star is blended with. Uh, with eclipsing binary. This the B stands for the first B stands for blended. Yeah, if, uh, yeah. This stands for blended, and there is there is a number of, of detections up to date those systems. Uh, it's, uh, the numbers, unfortunately, we cannot <coughs> neglect if we have the population of planets, exoplanets, no exoplanets around six six thousand. It's it's almost the same. It's only only an order of magnitude lower. So basically, we can we can make some cuts on that. The cuts on the on the and uh, variation of SNR, so then we can cut uh, a huge population of the hierarchical uh, eclipsing binaries and huge part of eclipsing binaries, but we cannot use this cut for other stuff. So so basically, there there will be a need to uh, observe the system and and try to establish a better parameters. The, one problem that uh, that TESS has, because of the very very large field of view, there is uh, for uh, we do not have a very high angular resolution. And with better angular resolution, you can get the better uh, estimates of the SNR and, and the better va uh, values of the of the from the SNR. These parameters of ellipsoidal variation of SNR we can do better with the better angular resolution. Okay, so future tools. Uh, if you if you are thinking about the studies on atmospheric of exoplanets, the, the TMT Giant Magellan Telescope and extremely large telescope could give us give us those hints. The, the other the direct imaging of the of the exoplanets. So also the the same set. And the future future missions it's James Webb Telescope and Last if it would be at last it's it's for the period was scheduled for the period 2025 to 2035 so maybe it would, it would happen uh, but let's let's look on the on the tools that we have because the trappist system as as, as which, which discovered the, the largest rocky system up to date was almost the, the size of the of the our plant telescope in, in Argentina Basically, what we what we can do is the transit observations. We can do it easily, and it was done. Uh, uh, the Sebastian Richard done it uh, summer. The other stuff is if we have the if we if we are using the, the uh, dull Kirkham uh, optics, we have a big field of view, uh, which which far far better uh, better uh, angular resolution than, than for example this. And what we can do is, for example, we can. Uh, there is a possibility to, uh, if, if, we, if we have time, to, for example, take uh, take the at least few regions of the sky, and take the images every ten minutes of this region. And then we can we can and after a week we 
could exclude that there is existing or existence of the rocky planets next to the next to the stars of the image that have the certain periods period of orbiting period and we can we can also do the machine learning algorithm or the data that we already collected if we have the if we have the many exposition of the of the of the certain field also we could try the micro lensing observations but it's uh, but it, for this one we we, we have to devote uh, many months of observation to get any, anything. But Ogle, Ogle is almost devoted, solely devoted to this one. And, we, and there is and the chance to getting something is, is relatively low comparing to this one, the trimet observations. So this is the data data taken uh, taken by uh, with the trimet of the planet HAT P55. Summer and there is a edit. Uh, what, what was important that this was this was the first observation of the transit uh, transit of the planet done in the in the CTMO and the, and I know that the research was, was worked on the photometric pipeline that is that reduced these errors quite much. So this is our data. Yeah, this is our data with an FOG with the Santa Barbara. This was done on the uh, San, This was actually done. We lost the Santa Barbara for the rest of the summer. So this was in June, uh, June 16th. So is this in Santa Barbara? Yeah, uh, this is in the visual band. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the gray lines are just the beginning and the end and the middle of the transit, and the red lines are averaged maxima and minima. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Did you, do I want to see? But, but we are we are looking at variations of also, uh, you know, much larger than than three hundred of, uh, of a magnitude. I should say that this was so that the air mass that night was two point three arc minutes, and the okay, error so the error is severely overestimated. I could bring that down by a factor of ten if I go through that data again. So it was a very good night. It was actually a very good night. The the error bars are a severe overestimation. But, but imagine what what we what we will have in Argentina. Oh, I mean, oh, oh, oh. order of mag uh, two orders of magnitude at least in the yeah. reduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so basically basically if we are if we are will be observing some fields with with enough ca cadence, mm -hmm. we can we can get get a lot. <clears throat> basically basically I think what was what would be the most most rewarding if we could. Uh, if the, the planets with the very short orbital period would be the most interesting, to mm -hmm. catch it, catch it over the over the night. Okay, basically, we know at this point we know that there is a lot of star system like ours, and and there is a many multiple uh, the, the system with multiple planets, uh, and there is a first. The, the first attempts were already uh, to, to measure the atmosphere of exoplanets. Even even there was there was a, a one attempt to, to make the successful mapping of the of the planet and to analyze the clouds on the planet. So basically, we could we we, we could learn a lot about those 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 planets. And what it's what it's more, uh, the tools are coming. So TMT and and the other stuff is. It's underway, and so our tools are, are coming coming fast. So more is yet to come. So basically, uh, one 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 anecdote which was which was a bit funny. I don't know if you if you read read Asimov uh, uh, Foundation Cycle. There was there was there, there was one 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 funny thing because the, what was the uniqueness uh, the, the uniqueness of uh, was considered that that uh, that the Earth could not exist because there were three three giant gas planets which which were thought to be very unlikely to, to be in one system. We know that the gas giant planets are very easy to detect, and there is a lot of them. So this was uh, this, this was one uh, how, how the, the same and probably Asimov right now would not write anything like that. <laughs> so. Like that. So I, I have some backup stuff, but if you have any question, I will be very happy to answer it. Answer it. Well, we should. People should go. Oh, 
Oh, you have chair. Oh, I just put a question. Does anybody have very back? Yeah. Does anybody have questions for Adam? Spectroscopic analysis, you would need to have a very uh, to, to detect exoplanets. You need to have the uh, radio velocity spectrometer. So you need something which which you can. Uh, it's rather for a very big big telescope. Uh, Three point six meter would, would do the do the trick. I'm afraid that half a meter would be a bit uh, a bit not enough. But, but basically, you can on, on, on our size of the telescope, we can easily observe transit as, as you and Sebastian through it. And, and I believe that if we, if we have the, this telescope in Argentina with, with, uh, with I don't know, 16K, uh, 16K uh, CCD, we could, we could, op we could do, uh, we even, I think, could discover some. If we, if we have the correct strategy, the, the writing the, the strategy for this it's it's also a, it's also could be could be interesting stuff. The other stuff is to do the good make the good photometric pipeline because this is a key to detect the transient yeah. and and maybe some machine learning algorithm to discriminate and to select few candidates because if you have the candidate then it's easy to focus on one or two than than to Basically, if we would like to search for exoplanets, we, we, we need a place that we can observe all, all way long, yeah, all, the time. all the time. And, and uh, there are three possibilities to do so. One possibility is to launch something to space. But it's, very, it's extremely expensive. But there are two other possibilities, which I think <coughs> which, which are the poles. Uh, and you have... Of course, on the pole for the half of a year you cannot observe, but for the other half of the year you, you have you have night. So basically, something that could be used easily used to, de to detect multiple uh, exoplanets would be uh, to, to put the telescope on the north pole, and then then you can uh, then you can uh, then you have a continuous data over a few months. Uh, so you can you can. Uh, well, about six. About six. I would say about five months. But yeah. Well, I've heard, yeah, yeah. But, but basically, basically, <coughs> you have a continuous data. Unfortunately, the, the, we, we, we were once thinking about, about putting the, the telescope on the, on the Svalbard, which is, uh, which is the, the Norwegian region, but unfortunately, on the, on the North Pole, the, it is, Svalbard is it's quite uh, humid due to the Gulf Stream. But the Canada could be could do this for. This place is South Pole. This particular yeah. south, the, the South Pole. Mm -hmm. Now Martin uh, worked a lot for his dissertation on data for the Sea Star, which is a Chinese telescope. That it turns out that it was a very small telescope, but it was fixed attached. Which means that all during the Antarctic winter, about six months, it was just moving. In, in a fixed point in the in the sky, there was there was some some motion because of the motion of the Earth. Um, it, it, it's not perfectly. It was almost aligned with the axis of rotation of the Earth, but but there's there still some motion that to account for. But the problem is that uh, there were a lot of uh, obvious data because of. Uh, of the traction on the lens because of the snow or the ice. <coughs> they call it a, the coffee thing. Yeah. Adam, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, the object of this telescope to find out the exoplanet, right? Uh, and we can find out this exoplanet using our telescope. Yeah. But rather than doing this, we send our satellite to orbit. So when I will send satellite to orbit, I can choose a different orbital, uh, uh, different orbit, like low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, but over here, this was high 
highly electrical orbit and the uh, eccentricity of this orbit is 0.55. So why they choose highly electrical orbit rather than choosing the Leo or Leo? Uh, I actually have an, I might have an answer to that. Okay. But that's because I was going to share about okay. the orbit. So yeah, 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 yeah. So I, this is coming from the Wikipedia page. It says, Tess uses a novel highly elliptical orbit around the Earth with an apogee approximately at the distance of the moon and a perigee of 108,000 kilometers. Tess orbits Earth twice during the time the moon orbits once, a two-to-one resonance with the moon, which would expect uh, to remain stable for a minimum of 10 years. So they basically have it in a resonant orbit. That keeps it minimally stable. So after 10 years, it could degrade, but that's that's the reason why. Otherwise, you'd have to put it beyond the, the, the moon, which is harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah what's, uh, so with this system, so when, when the, with these techniques, you can, you can uh, estimate uh, radius and mass, uh, and with that, you, you you do an educated guess on what type of planet? Yes, yes. Is there, a, is there an overlap? Uh, because, you know, if you, if you draw radius, mass, you say, okay, here, giant, that giant, rocky thing. So is there an overlap regions where you wouldn't be able to tell uh, whether it's a gas giant or... Because I imagine that it might be confusing. There is, so yeah, there is, there is. I, I just, I, I, I put it, uh, if you go back, here, there is a ice giant. There is an overlap between uh, rocky planets and ice giants. Um, but with the hot Jupiter's and rocky planets, I think there is now. Yeah. For sure, you need both. You need radial velocity and transit because if you just do transit, there's a degeneracy with the angle of inclination mm -hmm. that's only broken with. A velocity measurement. So I think when you have both, you can, I don't remember if there's any degeneracy in any distribution, but you need both, both radio velocity and transit to get the density. Basically, one, one, one other stuff, this is, this is the telescopes that would be, uh, that would start in the, in the few years, the 30 meter, uh, the Magellan, the Giant Magellan is 2020, I think they, they almost kept, kept the, the term, uh, the time, but the Hubble Space Telescope was just rebuilt. I'm noticing the overwhelmingly large yeah, yeah, telescope, yeah, but, that giant wait, 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 wait. ring. But look at the James <laughs> Webb. So it's yeah. deceiving. James Webb and Hubble operate with perfect C. Mm -hmm. Right. And all these giant things have to deal with the atmosphere. And, and this one, this one, the biggest one is the dish of Arecibo. Arecibo uh, <laughs> telescope. Actually, now it's the fast tele the, yeah, the, the fast, fast telescope is bigger now. But uh, th wasn't there? I mean, as another comparison to follow, uh, like what Mario said, um, you have those. I mean, quote unquote, smaller scopes, the James Webb and the Hubble telescopes with perfect seeing. To get like the the Keck Observatory up there, they I think it was the Keck was recently they recently beat the. Hubble in terms of clarity using adaptive optics or something like that, but that was after very, very, very careful yeah. implementation of that technique. Yeah, Kepler, Kepler is in fact had the smaller mirror than the Hubble Space Telescope, and Gaia have a very uh, weird type of mirror. But there, there is uh, from Gaia there, there are no exoplanets up to now. I think from Wise Wise server there, there, there is some exoplanets. From Kepler, Kepler, of course, there are, but but, but with, uh, with Gaia, there is none yet found in the data. But Gaia had a bit different, different values. There is one more stuff which was funny because this was this was very from the Super Wasp, and the, they were observing the difference of the of the. Uh, Day and night on the on the on the hot Jupiter. So there is a the Jupiter was turning from the from from the from the, the, the part which was which was lighting up and so and this was this was from from May May this year from Super Wasp. There, it was thermal phase curve observation of, of one of the of the planets discovered by Super Wasp. 
basically super wasp has a, a lot of very interesting stuff. Well, one important thing is the air candidate that we can try for with these telescopes or other telescopes that we have access to. I mean, this I mean the one we have in, in the park, but also <clears throat> when Taurus is operational, hopefully next year, it's going to be following up alarms from uh, LIGO, but the idea is that uh, the alarms are going to happen about once a month, so there's a lot of time, you'll say, that will be cool things to follow, a lot of projects for, for students to work on. Um, we probably should be wrapping this up, right? Because yeah. we're really past our time. We are past our time, so. Um, so up okay. next Thursday, yeah. Can so I just, I'm gonna close this. At, oh, yeah, 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 No yeah. other questions? <clears throat> All right, uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. <clears throat>